Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Founders Grid sponsored by Gaper.io. Today we have Sky. Sky is the managing partner and founder of BU Venture Partners. Sky, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So give us a brief background about yourself before BU Venture Partners. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've been doing venture capital now for a uh, little over 12 years. Um, started off doing traditional venture capital in kind of seed series A, series B deals as a, as a true generalist. Um, was fortunate uh, to launch a corporate venture fund um, called Simon Venture Group, uh, which is for a company called Simon Property Group, uh, which is an S&P 100 company um, and is the largest retail real estate company in the world. Um, at the time when I was there, there uh, the retail sales across Simon uh, were larger than Apple and Amazon combined, which is amazing. Um, and it's amazing how things have changed in seven or so years. Um, but uh, just to give you a side of how large Simon was, um, when you're the largest retail real estate company, or you're sitting on over 100 billion or so of, uh, of value. Um, and so uh, I was fortunate, I founded the fund uh, myself, uh, ran it for a few years. Um, I did that all under the age of 30. So I think I was the, the youngest person uh, managing a corporate venture fund um, of that size under the age of 30. Um, oh, did a lot of uh, investing in retail brands, uh, retail technology, uh, and real estate technology. Um, and had uh, I wasn't expecting any significant exits in the first three years, uh, but we had two really big exits. Um, one was a company called Sensity, uh, which was an internet of things for smart cities, smart buildings uh, that Verizon acquired. And we made a little over 3x um, in about 17 months, and it was the, the biggest investment I had made. Uh, and then we also had Shopkick, uh, a loyalty platform that got acquired by SK Telecom, uh, which was also a really uh, large exit for us um, in a relatively short period of time. Um, invested in about 30, about 29 companies when I was at Simon. Um, some of the big successes there were on the retail brand side. Uh, we had things uh, such as MeUndies, uh, the an underwear subscription, um, Latote for uh, renting everyday clothes for women. Um, and a really strong uh, breadth of one, one of the biggest successes we had there was a company called FabFitFun uh, subscription box for women. We invested at about a $20 million valuation um, and it's now worth over a billion dollars. Um, that one itself kind of returned the, the whole fund on value um, and uh, was highly capital efficient. They didn't raise any capital for about four to five years after we invested and then they raised 80 million at over a billion. Um, I was fortunate then to have, um, I got introduced to the former CEO of McDonald's um, who was at McDonald's for about 20 years and president CEO for five years. Um, one of the board members of Simon introduced me to him um, and wanted to know if I'd be interested in helping them launch a fund. So uh, I left uh, Simon after a few years and I launched Cleveland Avenue, um, which was a $125 million fund. Um, and there I built out the portfolio to about 10 core companies in the food and beverage space, food and beverage technology space, um, and new restaurant concepts. Um, probably one of the, the biggest successes uh, there was um, I became the largest investor in a company called Beyond Meat uh, that you might be familiar with. It's a plant-based uh, protein where it kind of looks like meat, tastes like meat, but it's entirely plant-based. So I, um, I participated in uh, an initial round and then I led the follow-on round to be the largest dollar investor in that company before the IPO um, and joined the board of directors. Um, that investment returned about two to three times the entire fund. Uh, within about three years of me launching the fund. So that was, that was awesome. And then uh, after that, I, uh, I came up with the idea of launching VU. And it really came from the approach of venture itself as an asset class is not very scalable um, in that you have you know, the largest amount of deal flow exists at the seed and series A level. But that's also where you have the smallest investment teams. Um, so if you, you know the typical... Fifty hundred million dollar fund can only support three to seven people. So how how is only three to seven people supposed to actually look at just such a massive amount of deal flow that exists in the seed and Series A level? You just can't effectively. And then as you go into the bigger funds like a, a Sequoia and NEA and Andreessen, you know now you have twenty to fifty person teams. But while they have more team members to look at deal flow, they're mainly focusing on later stage ventures, so B, C, and D rounds where they're putting in bigger checks and they're just not looking at as many companies and not as many companies exist that are raising capital in the kind of series C forward. So it just, there's a misalignment between where the majority of the deal flow exists and team sizes. So I said, what can I do to break that model 
where I could effectively do venture capital at scale. And so I came up with the idea of creating an investor accelerator where rather than a startup accelerator, people join um, that are looking to be investors um, during and after the program. Um, and so we accept right now about 30 people a cohort um, out of a few thousand applications. Um, the uh, acceptance rate is harder to get into than Harvard or Princeton. Um, and the people's backgrounds are, um, you know, they either came from Ivy League schools, they worked at top places before, they founded companies and then sold those companies. Uh, but they joined my investment team for three months to 12 months as part of this investor accelerator. And so it allows us to have a much larger investment team. So we have a 35 person investment team and that allows us to source significantly more deal flow. So we're, we're sourcing right now about 3000 to 5,000 deals a quarter um, or about 18 ish thousand on average per year. Um, and we believe mathematically we're, we're sourcing more deal flow than any other venture fund in the world right now. Most traditional funds will source like a thousand to 2000 a year. So we're about 20 times or so the amount of deal flow uh, that a traditional fund looks at. And even like a Sequoia and NEA, they're sourcing three to 5,000 a, a year, and we're sourcing that a quarter, so about four times more deal flow than even a multi-billion dollar fund. And this is allowing us to be highly selective. So we're, we're investing in only about two to five companies a quarter, so we're, it's about a 0.1% selectivity. Most funds are investing in 1% of the deals they look at, they'll invest in 10 out of every thousand. Um, we're at 0.1%, so our selectivity is about 10 times more selective than a traditional fund. So our model is really interesting because it's helping to create the future of the venture capital ecosystem. And as people graduate from Venture University, our, our accelerator, they're working into other funds, and now we have access to a growing number of proprietary deal flow at other funds. Um, and we're at about 200 um, graduates from Venture University, and we're growing to about 1,000 uh, individuals over the next kind of three to four years um, between our offices in San Francisco, New York, and Hong Kong. Yeah. Wow, amazing, amazing journey. Wow. So, and uh, we've discussed the VU venture part. Uh, unfortunate times because of COVID, right? And the whole world is going through a more of a psychological shift, transitional shift. You know, we've seen the e-commerce happening at a fast pace. It has, uh, while it has resulted in many businesses closing down, but it has also resulted in acting as a catalyst for others, right? And we're hearing stories that many VCs are rethinking their investment thesis. Startups are being told that increase your runways from 12 months to two years, two and a half years, become more capital efficient and all, right? Yes. So just adding your thoughts to these, you know, how do you see the post-COVID world when it, as an investor, as a VC, how do you see it evolving? Yeah, so I think, you know, my 12 years of venture um, and my partner Andrew's 25 years. So collectively, we have about 35 years of venture experience. And on reflecting on that, we, we've been thinking about this question a lot. If you're a fund manager and you have a 10-year fund, which is the average fund life, and a down economy happens every 10 years, you're probably going to hit one or two down cycles with every fund. And so you need to be focused on investing in not just once, you should really be focusing on needs. And the, the, if you build out a portfolio that's really based around need-based and not wants, then you should be building a portfolio that has a much higher probability of surviving down economies um, and uh, can get through the, the rough storm. Um, you know, Andrew and I, uh, every fund we've had has returned one, you know, one or multiple times with a fund in just one company. So you know, being early investors in Facebook, Uber, Twitter, Venmo, um, you know, those are things that just become paradigm shifts for the entire industries that they're in. So what I would say is we're, we're not changing our investment thesis at all. We're, we're still very much focused on going after the largest markets that exist. Um, and so, for example, we're, we're actively investing in the future of food. Uh, we've done a, um, two different lab-growing food companies that are lab-growing cells um, of, uh, of muscle. Uh, we just closed a deal um, for lab growing blood um, at scale. Uh, we're we about to close a company that's doing uh, autonomous driving for tractors. Um, so the the deals that we're doing are are not something that are uh, episodic that are going to be you know in the early time affected by COVID. I think the challenge is you deal with a lot of first time fund managers that don't have a lot of experience in investing, and you're doing a lot of things that are more impacted by the economy. 
Um, so we're, we're pretty impressed. The majority of our portfolio um, will not be affected by COVID and has not been affected. We certainly have a few companies that have been, um, but, uh, but overall, we've been pretty happy with our thesis. So we're going to still focus on the largest market opportunities that exist um, and the ones that are needs versus wants. Um, I will think that you know, whenever you have down economies, usually the tourists within venture capital, this is when they exit. Um, and so it's whether or not you've actually you're building a real career in the industry um, or you're, you're selectively making investments and you're not really building on a, a strong enough portfolio. Um, but I think that this is also the best time to be investing. Like we've, we've definitely not seen a shortage of deal flow. Um, companies need capital now more than ever. Um, what you do need to focus on are, you know, what are the unique opportunities where people are losing their jobs and now starting the company as they ever, they always thought they were going to want to go start. And now they're actually going to go do it. So some of the best companies have been started during down economies and we're, we're looking for the founders that have now been kind of pushed off the ledge to go start those next big things. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, remote work, you know, the last two years, or last three years, you know, we've been seeing remote work on the rise and then there was a lot of discussion going around. Do we need offices? The co-working spaces picked up, then the WeWork debacle started happening and now COVID. So, how do you perceive the future of the co-workings and the remote work? Do sure. It's, or, a, it's a fun one. So one of our portfolio companies that looks like they're, uh, they're not doing so well um, was a co-working company uh, called The Riveter, which is a, a female-focused uh, version of WeWork. Um, it looks like that may be a, you know, a company that is definitely on the chopping block unless they can restructure themselves and move forward. Um, so I, I think the, the future of co-working is definitely going to change. Um, on a flip side, a company that we just invested in called Room, um, R-O-O-M, they're building out the future of the working space kind of post-COVID. Um, and they were really the leader in phone booths before COVID happened. And the, the manufacturing of phone booths doesn't sound like the most sexy venture capital sector to be investing in. Um, but when you look at their traction, um, they've raised a relatively um, modest amount of money and they've hit about a 10 times capital efficiency. So turning the, the capital they've spent to date into about 10 times that in revenue. Uh, and they just closed another $10 million that we came in on. And if they can turn that 10 million into another 100 million, you know, this is a, being in the phone booth industry is, is a pretty good business. Um, and so, you know, the future of work is, you know, it, before with just phone booths, it was how do you have a private space to make a phone call, but now we're looking at what's the future of cubicles where you can't be six feet away and still have the same workforce. You just can't, you can't fit everybody in. So you kind of need a new, you know, new version of what a cubicle looks like um, designed for the post COVID era. Um, that's kind of exactly what, uh, what room is focusing on. So I think with those type of things, there will be companies that um, win because of the future of, of where COVID puts us. But the, the, the virtual co-working space, virtual world that we're living in now, um, I think everyone's learning that they don't need as much as what they were living on before. I, I, I probably have the most savings I've ever collected in the last two months. I think most people are probably increasing the amount of savings than, than ever before. So I think there's a, a readjustment to how we spend our money and what is actually needed. Um, and we're also, I think, getting very comfortable working from home. Uh, yeah, that'll certainly affect real estate prices and, and rent. Um, but we came up with our own team. We came up with a lot of ways of bonding and coming up with fun experiences and engagement virtually. Uh, we have a virtual office um, using a platform called Sococo. Um, it's like So Chocolate, So Coco, um, where it feels like you're in an office and everyone has their own virtual space that can meet in a conference room or a boardroom. Um, and we've done a lot of things like uh, wine tasting together. We did a virtual escape room. Um, we do uh, virtual uh, water cooler times to catch up with each other. So um, it's not really changed how we operate. And I think as venture investors, you can kind of do your job from anywhere, whether it's from a, a Starbucks cafe or home. And 80% of our calls were virtual anyways. So it was just a question of whether we were doing a, a, a Zoom from our office or a Zoom from our home. So the way that we operate certainly hasn't been uh, that much affected. Uh, but I am looking forward to going back into the office. I think from a bonding experience, you can't replace um, in person and just the, 
the serendipity and the, the closeness that that develops. So looking forward to going back, hopefully over the next few months uh, back into the office. But um, I think people learned that it, this is definitely achievable to, to do work virtually. Last question, Sky. Uh, any three pieces of advice would you like to give to young startup founders who are just starting out? The same, I would appreciate the same advice you've given to your portfolio companies, the secret yeah. sauce. Right? So, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, some of the top advice I would give is, uh, depending on if you have an MBA or not, you may have once thought that uh, team was the most important thing if you went to an MBA program. And they usually tell you that because they're hoping you're going to be an executive at some large company where team is what matters. But that's really for established companies that already exist and have already proven market, you know, product market fit. After the 12 years of venture experience, I'd argue that team is actually not the most important thing. What I would focus on is market size and the market that you're going after, because you can go after a really large market opportunity with a subpar team and a subpar, pro, you know, subpar product and actually do really well. But if you have the best team in the world and the best product in the world and the market is not big, you're just never going to have a huge success. So um, I think team's still really important, but I would really focus on is your market size opportunity actually really large? Because that's usually where most founders miss the point and why they don't raise venture capital. So, um, you know, the, the likes of like a cruise automation that got acquired by GM for a billion dollars after only being around for 17 months, you know, they had a basic product, um, but they were going after a really big market opportunity. And you, I think you find where venture is finances, you really have to focus on really big market opportunities. So um, focus on that above and be all, all else. Um, it doesn't matter at the end of the day how good your team is. Um, but uh, team is still important. You call it a second, the second most important thing, but not the first most important thing. Again, you can have the best team in the world, best product. The market's not big. You're not going to have a big exit. Um, next, second piece of advice that I would give would be, you know, give yourself the time to actually figure out what company you're going to create. I think a lot of founders just start the first company they think of, and they don't actually compete their idea against a bunch of other ideas. And I would take the, the role of more like a venture investor where, you know, we're looking at four to 5,000 companies a quarter to make two to five investments. You know, you should go through a, a process where you're looking at a whole bunch of opportunities of things that you could create, things, companies you could join that are even bigger opportunities. But, you know, you, don't, you only have a certain amount of time on this planet right now. Um, so you want to use your time wisely. And the first idea that pops in your head might not be the best startup to waste the next six to 12 months of your life on. So really put in the time to really compete lots of different opportunities against each other um, to find the best one. And I think we're, we're at a unique part in society where it's easier now more than ever to kind of find where big opportunities are that you can either join or create and find team members uh, to do it. So that'd be my second point is just really, really compete best of opportunities against each other um, and third, third thing, I guess, for a piece of advice, I would say is, um, you know, really be careful when you select the people that you're going to start a company with and who you bring on to your team early on. Most people suck. And I think you, the sooner you can realize that, um, the sooner you'll be better. Um, you know, unfortunately, you can't trust anybody. Um, and um, you know, the big, one of the biggest reasons that people, companies die, um, it's not because of your competition. Um, more companies die by suicide than from homicide. So really focus on the people that you're bringing to your team, that they're really high integrity. I would really don't miss the chance to do reference checks, um, but I've seen too many big disappointments where founders break up and that's why great companies die. Um, and it just goes back to the, the average person is not trustworthy. Um, and the average person um, is just self-interested. Um, and so be really careful because unfortunately, most people suck. So um, never forget that and be highly doubtful of anyone that you engage with because this is really a kind of a dog eat dog world and it's jungle rules at the end of the day. Um, and just don't forget that. Sky, thank you so much for being on the show. I would have loved to continue, but my marketing team tells me, you know, I am on a hard punch line. So thank you so no much. Problem. Absolutely. Thank you.